one of the pivot, a weekly series of informational discussions uh, that cover local, regional, and national issues in the midst and following the current pandemic. This event is presented exclusively by the Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce. My role as moderator is to introduce our guests, get the discussion started with some questions, and give those attending live the opportunity to participate by using the chat or Q&A functions, which Rebecca will be monitoring. Thank you for taking the time with your Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce to join fellow members in staying informed, to help you care for your team, your clients, and customers, and take care of business in this post-pandemic uh, climate. The pandemic has many of us glued to various media outlets, trying to understand what we're facing now and how it's likely to change in coming weeks and months. For those who like a closer look, we'll be getting granular, so to speak, actually molecular with today's guests. Let's meet them and get right into the questions. Our first guest is Dr. Michael Schmidt. Dr. Schmidt earned his PhD from Indiana University Bloomington and rose through the ranks of the Medical University of South Carolina, earning the title of tenured professor of microbiology and immunology. He was elected to fellowship in the American Academy of Microbiology and the American College of Dentists. Currently, he is leading an interinstitutional, interdisciplinary team of professionals investigating the role that microbes associated with objects present in the built clinical environment play in the acquisition of a healthcare associated infections or HAI. Dr. Schmidt is active in the educational missions of the College of Dentistry, the Colleges of Dentistry, Graduate Studies and Medicine at MUSC. Presently, he is the chair of the Council for Microbial Studies, where he has recently led efforts in convening a global summit on SARS-CoV-2 back in March. He has twice been a panelist on NPR's Science Friday. His most significant publications and patents have been in the area of the control of healthcare associated infections, phage therapy, and the mineralization of vapor phase solvents. Mike, welcome to The Pivot. I have to remember to unmute myself and turn on my video. Thank you, John. It's great to be with you all here today. Hopefully you were able to see and hear me. And um, I'm going to share with you uh, the fundamental question that everyone who knows me stops me on the street with their mask on and asks me but one question. When will things ever return to normal? And my answer to them is we need to fundamentally build herd immunity. Herd immunity is this complex epidemiological concept, but it's really simple. It simply means that the virus continues to multiply in our naive population. And a naive population is someone who's never had COVID. And the good news, bad news about living in Charleston is we've been blessed. We haven't seen very many COVID cases here in the Low Country, unlike our sisters in Columbia and in Greenville that have had much higher concentrations of the infection. And so consequently, we have a lot of naive individuals living in the Low Country who have not been exposed to the infectious agent SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID. And the consequence is that we are susceptible for the infamous second wave. And what we need to be able to do is to literally, to use the, the famous microbiology microbiologist, Barney Fife, we have to nip it in the bud. <laughs> and we know how to do that. Um, you have heard our governor advocate the wearing of face masks. Face masks are this inexpensive throwaway product that every man, woman, and child can easily put onto themselves and wear uh, when they're out and about, not with their family unit that lives with them. And what that principally does is it facilitates the, the dispersion. It, it prevents it from you 
uh, spreading it to people like John or people like Rebecca or my colleague, John Camisi, who's going to join us here in a few minutes. And that's what we have to control. We have to control ourselves. If we get the herd immunity numbers up, that is, many more of us have been infected, that has consequences. The elderly, the infirm, people with diabetes, heart disease, strokes, will um, have bad consequences. And so we have to rely on the scientific and medical community to work tirelessly in developing a vaccine or finding appropriate medications that can control the um, disease process that is COVID-19. Right now, uh, we have heard a lot in the popular press about an antiviral, remdesivir, and they have had gotten good data showing that remdesivir can lessen your hospitalization stay. They continue to do trials trying to see if remdesivir will prevent infections, but to date we don't have any information on that. But we really need to take a page from our scientists who have gone before us who have worked on HIV and hepatitis C. And if you know anything about the medications that those individuals with those two devastating diseases take, they often take a combination of medicines to combat those viruses. The HIV individual will take three distinct medications that will inhibit the virus, and hepatitis C takes two. And so we're likely going to need two medications to effectively, as Barney would say, nip this in the bud. Mike, thank you. Um, we'll, uh, we'll get into this much uh, more deeply. And, but let's welcome uh, Dr. John Camisi. Dr. Camisi practiced general dentistry successfully in Ithaca, New York for 35 years before relocating to Charleston in August of 2017 to join the faculty at the MUSC James B. Edwards College of Dental Medicine as an assistant professor. He's now an associate professor and is the course director for the college's Operative II, which is Adhesive and Aesthetic Dentistry course, chair of the Oral, Rehabil Oral Rehabilitation Department's Dental Materials Committee, and the Infection Control Officer for the college, he is currently the secretary treasurer of the South Carolina Dental Association. He's earned his doctor of dental surgery, DDS degree from Northwestern University and his bachelor of science in biology at Fordham. Welcome, John. Thank you very much, John. Very nice to be here with you, Michael and Rebecca. Now, you and, uh, you and Mike Schmidt work together and uh, maybe we should say conspire on some things. On a regular oh, yeah. basis. <laughs> <laughs> Much of the chagrin of our students and the dean. <laughs> They're getting over it. <laughs> so um, tell me how the, uh, what we're going through right now plays into your role as the infection control officer. It wreaks havoc every day. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it, it's been a long 14 or 15 weeks in my life, as Michael and I could very well attest to. Since about the end of February, we have been watching the world start to close down, and the college closed down on March the 13th. Uh, we were fortunate in that the week of March 8th, the college was on spring break. So we had a week to prepare without students to determine what we were going to be doing, and uh, we made the decision on uh, before the 13th that the college would be closed at least on a short-term basis until we could figure out what was going to happen next. Uh, we're still in a very, very modified uh, operations at this point in time. So we're struggling to move back to what we like to call normal. Uh, and that's because, as Michael indicated a few minutes ago, we have a very challenging disease that we're trying to get a handle on and hopefully someday soon, we will have that <laughs> under control to a higher degree because I know that the scientists around the world are struggling or are searching valiantly for a, uh, a cure 
in addition, a therapeutic uh, and, and a reliable long-term testing mechanism that we can count on to show us the immunity that Michael referred to earlier in herd immunity. Well, thank you. Um, so glad to have the both of you here. And, and um, Mike, I forgive me for calling you by the name I've called you by. For no, you years. can do that, John. Um, and, um, and Dr. Kamisi, if I may call you John, we Please. may get a little com confused with two of us here. But, um, and, and throw in, uh, this is, you know, questions are for everybody. Our, our guests know that they can throw in with questions as well. And Rebecca is going to be looking uh, into the chat room as people uh, have a question, they can do that. And um, we do know that, um, Dr. Kamisi, that your name is misspelled on the screen. There is an I at the end of that, and we- uh, that's, that's because I'm a, nice I'm a nice Irish boy. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little it, bit It's probably on your end, John, and how you possible. set up Zoom. <laughs> <It's possible. laughs> Listen, if we're going to be inaccurate or inexact, that's where we want to do it. We don't exactly. want to get that. We don't want yes. to get that elsewhere. So, um, Mike, you started us and, and talked a little bit about um, the when when you use the term naive, it's that we haven't been faced, we haven't uh, had either a, a, an immunization or an experience with this particular virus, which means we're susceptible. More yeah, the perhaps. human race has never seen this virus ever. And that's very unusual for viruses. This is what is termed an emerging infection. And as anyone who has been paying attention to the local media know, that this virus uh, probably jumped from bats to people. And that's another question that folks often ask is, why bats? And the simple answer is, aside from the human race, bats are the only mammal that flies. And they can effectively move the virus from one location to another, analogously to the way we move viruses very conveniently from Chicago to New York, or from Hong Kong to Los Angeles. And so these bats, and again, a bat is a mammal, just like us, and the virus can adapt to animals. And this is what was referred to as a zoonosis or an infection that normally infects an animal and jumped to people. So, with all of that, and, and with people in Charleston wondering, you know, what's next? Um, if, if indeed we have been blessed in this first round, if you will, what can round two, round three, is it, is it a matter of when rather than if there will be a round two? How does that look? We have a choice. Uh, the data that have come out of the country of Taiwan, which is a nation of about 24 million people, they have had very few cases. Um, when you contrast Taiwan against a state of the United States like New York, New York has about 20 million, Taiwan has about 24 million people. And what Taiwan did very early in January is they suggested to their people, everyone who goes outside, please wear a mask. And they did. And the consequence is they have only had 441 total cases in all of Taiwan since January and only seven deaths. When you contrast it to New York, New York as of today has had uh, 353,000 cases and uh, 30,000 30, folks have died. And it was sim and we cratered our economy, whereas Taiwan didn't even turn off their economy. The only thing they did is had the folks wear masks and they had access to testing very early on. And they very early in their, their outbreak, 
they enabled contact tracing. So if Dr. Comisi got infected and I was in his office yesterday, I would get a notice from our health department saying, hey, you may want to go lock yourself in a room for two weeks until you're no longer uh, potentially infectious. And that's what the Taiwanese did. And they were able to contain their outbreak. Mm -hmm. Charleston has a unique opportunity if we wear masks and we follow the advice of DHEC. If we just behave and wear our masks out in public, and I saw today that our clinic dean, Dr. Tyke, admonished our employees and our students for not wearing their masks out in the halls, rightly so, and, and John and I are the bad cops uh, because we're the ones telling Dr. Tyke to send the nasty gram. I did. And um, <laughs> it, it really works. Now, you're gonna say, well, my employees are in a restaurant business and they like to, they have trouble communicating with the customers with the mask. Well, we know that face shields, you know, this clear plexiglass works just as well at a mask at preventing me or John from dispensing the virus to others. And yet you can see my lips. So if you're hard of hearing and reading lips, you can read my lips. And the, the, all the debris hits that plexiglass shield, bounces back into my clothing. And then what I do when I come home is I take off my clothes, put them in the washer so I don't contaminate any of my clean clothing or my furniture with the virus, and then pick it up later so that you, know, you can control for this. And unfortunately, we have heard that many of the restaurants that aggressively opened and the folks weren't adhering to mass policies, some of the staff have come down with COVID. And again, the take home message is mass and face shields work, full stop. So we have an opportunity to control our destiny. We can decide how big we want round two to be. And that's the approach that we have been taking in the College of Dental Medicine. And John may want to share with how we're opening that aspect back up to the community to keep everyone safe. Yeah, we're, we're, we're gradually moving forward with treatment of our regular patients. And we're staging things so that this way we can be sure that everyone at the college has the appropriate knowledge and training and uh, regular aspect of doing things. Because again, some of, not all everything, but some of this is very unique. And some of it is very different from uh, what we're we were typically doing, the in 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 incorporating the face shields on a regular basis. In my private practice prior to coming to uh, Charles Charleston, I wore full PPE all the time. In fact, I wore, Device John's got one of the face shields. Not unlike that. I've, I've, got, I've got various types here. I've got more props. I feel like Vanna White at the moment. <laughs> uh, but you know, this, this is not unlike the face shield that I wore in my private practice, simply mm -hmm. because my wife, who was my infection control officer, she is a member of the OSAP organization, she trained us on how to do things properly. So by osmosis and her continued beatings, I learned this and then and then working with Michael continues my education uh, because you know we learn collectively and the more that we share the knowledge together we can become better at it so here at the college we're moving forward we're looking at how are we going to take care of our patients just like the rest of the dental community is doing right now we have guidelines set up by CDC and the American Dental Association which every dental office in the country is now following uh, interestingly enough, and Michael, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, to date, there has not been a report of a dental transmission of the disease at this point. That is still correct. And one of the reasons for that is because dentistry has been using some form of very good PPE 
to protect our patients and ourselves for all of these years with, with and without a face shield up until this point, wearing masks on a regular basis for everybody that we've seen, using the various isolation devices that we use when we're doing aerosolization procedures. In fact, we are in the process of publication of an article that shows that the aerosol reduction from dental procedures using the high-speed evacuators that we use significantly reduces the aerosol in the, uh, in the, in the room. So going to the dentist that are using all of the appropriate PPE and high, vacuum, uh, evac high volume evacuation and isolation devices will significantly reduce the risk of contracting disease via that. I'm more afraid talking with people. I'm more afraid going out and finding folks in the corridor who are not wearing these, talking to each other and not thinking about how this virus transmits. This is a respiratory ailment more than anything else, as, as Michael was indicating earlier. The choirs that contracted the disease from the volume of air circulating through the choir. I'm a member of my choir. I'm having a really tough time going back and singing in a congregation that hasn't figured out how to protect themselves. So the reality here is that we have some challenges ahead of us. These are solvable. We're just looking for the solutions that can help protect us all. So if you've got to go to the dentist and if you've got to come here to the dental college, we have put in, into place various protocols that we're using and we're evolving them as time are going by and we'll see how things go, but we're staging it in to make sure that we take care of everybody as beneficially as possible because we care about you just like you care about your families. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. And everyone who's ever been to the dentist in the last six months knows what the high, you know, the high volume extractors are. It's that silly little straw they hand to you and say, you may now put it in and suck everything out. That's, that's the low volume one. The other one is the loud one that just basically sounds yeah. like it's a train, you know, it's coming at you. Form going at you. That is where, you know, the, the low speed evacuator is helpful and remove the saliva, but the high vacuum, high volume evacuation is what gets all of the stuff in the air out of the body. Yeah. So that's the twofold attack that we do in dentistry, plus the isolation with that rubber trampoline that we put on your mouth. So, yeah. The other, the other thing, John, is that we're also advocating testing. Oh, yeah. And, and testing can be a bit of a confusing mishmash. And so I'd like to take a couple of minutes here to describe what testing is all about, because that was an integral component of keeping Taiwan safe. Congressman Cunningham has made testing available to our low country citizens. So we have that available. The Medical University has stood up various testing centers. And so there are a number of tests out there and it's hard to keep them straight. So the first thing you have to do is ask the question, what is the test looking for? The first test that made it into the market was effectively looking for pieces of the instruction set from the virus that said, I'm going to make you sick. And in the United States, the CDC developed that test. It had three targets in the instruction set that it looked for. If all three were positive, you were positive. Um, as the tests were refined, they had simplified it to look for two targets. And in some cases, only one target. And so that is how you get the false negatives. And the problem that we have of discriminating as to whether or not pieces of the virus are present is we have no gold standard to compare it to other than if you're sick. And if you're sick, you don't care if you're positive or negative, you just wanna get better. Right? And so that's item number one. Then the other thing that you have to keep in the back of your mind is these two magic words, 
sensitivity, and specificity. They sound synonymous, but they're not. The sensitivity measures the percentage of the time that it will pull out a true positive. That's a good number. You want that number to be as close to 100% as possible. The reason for that is if you're positive and you're out walking in the publics, you want to be making certain that you're staying at home or at least wearing your mask so you don't infect the deli counter. Um, so that's the true positive number. And the test that we're using at the medical university is up in the 90s. So that's good news. Then you have to worry about the specificity function, which is truly negative. And that's also a good number to have up near 100%. Because that's very important if Dr. Comisi is, God forbid, exposed and then becomes infectious and I talk to him and they say, okay, Schmidt, go get a test. And I come back negative. I want to know that I'm really negative and it's not missing it. Right. So that's the thing to keep in the back of your mind. The differences between those two words that sound similar and the way I always remember it is alphabetical. Sensitivity comes before specificity and positive comes before negative or backwards, vice versa. Uh, <laughs> I, I know, got it. I understood thing. completely what you were talking about. Yeah, you understand. <laughs> now you know what my poor students go through. Uh, but at the same time, the medical university and others out there, Roper and others are standing this up, is the serology test. This is where you roll up your sleeve, they draw some blood, and they asked, this test asked the question, has John Carroll been exposed? He may never have displayed a symptom and then mounted his immune response and is now effectively cured. And that's what the serology test asks. It asks a question, has, have you been exposed to the virus and made an antibody? This will give us a sense of how far this virus has penetrated our community because the PCR test is a snapshot. It only tells if I'm infected now. And the body quickly throws this virus out, oftentimes within less than seven days. So then why are you sick for 30? And the answer is your immune system is just fed up and is punishing you because your immune system is reacting badly to this virus because of how the virus causes all of its bad things. And everybody's course seems to be a little bit different. We know that Congressman Cunningham lost his taste of his sense of smell and taste. And he told his wife her spaghetti was no good, very bad. And, um, but eventually his test came back and hopefully her spaghetti was good. Um, you know, John, John Comisi goes through this with his dear wife because he posts about her sauce on Facebook. My sauce. <laughs> That's your sauce. Oh, your sauce, okay. So, difference. I mean, but everybody's symptoms are a, a bit different. And so I think, that's what we have to effectively uh, think about. And now there are some new tests coming out that just ask the question, are there viral particles present in a specimen, whether it be a nasal swab or your saliva? And we're beginning to stand those tests up. The President of the United States is taking one of those tests on a daily basis, as are his staff. But unfortunately, the sensitivity of those tests aren't as good. They're down in the 50%. And mm -hmm. so you're better off flipping a coin than, you know, staking your reputation. But 
um, you know, he's got plenty of doctors around him taking care of him. So he's probably better off than the majority of us. Right. So, so that's our trick, mass and testing. And then the next step is contact tracing. But contact tracing is going to be hard because the horse has effectively left the barn, unlike Taiwan, where the horses, they sort of knew which pasture they were in. Now the United States is literally covered coast to coast with this virus and we're having summer vacation. Families are visiting families. People are coming to Charleston to go to the beach, Myrtle Beach. And unfortunately, we have to encourage our friends who are coming to visit to say, hey, you should be wearing a mask. It's not going to kill you. It's actually going to save us, save us all so we can stand up our economy and get back to normal. Yeah. So we're talking about the testing and about whether we've, we've already uh, got it or had it or we're about to have to deal with it. Um, the vaccine becomes another big question and you were referring to uh, in our conversation before we got started, Mike, uh, about the Remdesivir. Um, but we've got a question from our listening audience. And Rebecca, if you want to pass that along, please. Happy to. Since the flu vaccine kind of works, will the COVID vaccine kind of work? The COVID vaccine is likely going to work much better than the flu vaccine. The, we're usually guessing with the flu vaccine because we really don't know what strain is going to come about every year. Is that pretty much the idea there, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. The, the flu virus is an odd virus. It has eight parts to it, and they can exchange sort of like trading Pokemon cards. And so every year the flu virus trades these Pokemon cards, and we try to guess which one it's going to get. And that's why the vaccine is a hit or miss. But the human race has seen the flu virus for a very long period of time. And so we have some sense of herd immunity against this virus. The good news about SARS-CoV-2 is that this virus is one long string, about 30,000. So it's got 30,000 pieces of information in it, and it's only changing 26 of them on an annual basis. So it's not changing very much. The data from the early safety trials are very encouraging. The Oxford vaccine that you've likely heard about is a variation in which you take an injection into the arm, and they have since uh, adapted that vaccine, inoculated uh, macaque monkeys, and showed that the monkeys withstood a COVID challenge and never got sick. Didn't have any bad outcomes. The monkey just ignored the challenge and seemingly was fine. So that vaccine, the United States has given AstraZeneca a uh, couple of billion dollars to fast track. And then there is another vaccine that is just a tiny piece of protein that they can mass manufacture in a large volume and make it readily available. And this is the Moderna vaccine. And it has shown surprisingly good safety data and good efficacy data but it has not published the monkey trials yet to see if it can withstand a challenge. So we're anxiously awaiting that. So, but there are over 90 candidate vaccines being tested at this point in time and likely more. So vaccines, as Dr. Fauci said, are likely gonna hit the market probably about the time that this pandemic got going in March of 2021. So we're likely going to see a vaccine at that point in time, which will really allow us to get back to normal if everyone has done their job and we have really 
nailed the vaccine construct. But I'm encouraged that there's at least 90 candidates out there. Uh, this is very different than what we saw with the first SARS virus. And we never got a candidate that we tested to the level and extent that we have tested um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, today. Uh, thank you for that. Um, that's, it's good to know that this one uh, will have a higher batting average just simply by the virtue of its composition. So as we, um, as we look at, uh, you know, moving back into opening the economy, what are the key things we ought to be thinking about as we return to work? First thing you need to think about is flushing your pipes. If you've not been to the office or the restaurant, turn on that water and let it run. I hate to say to waste some water, but you really need to bring the, the level of chlorine up to the specifications that come out of the Mount Pleasant water plant. The chlorine has you know, effectively done its job. It's been sitting now potentially for two, three months and you should flush the pipes and you know, Mount Pleasant Water has a recommendation of how long you should let it run. If you're running a motel or hotel, you, you have to make certain that your showers are free of, of Legionella. And you know, people running hotels and motels know about the hazards of, of Legionella. The, the good news about you know, running and decontaminating your business is you don't need any special disinfectants. You can get away with a few drops of Dawn dishwashing detergent and warm water, let it suds up, because this virus, you look at it funny with soap and it's dead. And the reason is you have to understand how this virus works. It's very similar to a letter you receive in the mail, and it's raining right now. So if you left your mailbox open, those letters are getting wet. So the envelope is being damaged, and that's effectively what soap does. It damages the envelope. So the contents or the instruction set can now be affected by the soap. And if the soap hits the instruction set, it's gone. So the virus is effectively inactivated, and our cells don't take up the virus from a damaged envelope. The envelope has to be pristine, and it, in order for it to get engulfed by our cells. So soap and water is by far the most readily available, least expensive, and very efficient at inactivating things. And if you have commercial uh, disinfectants that the EPA recommends, make sure you follow label directions. Yeah. That's what John and I spent two days taking pictures of all the stuff that we have at um, in the dental clinic, making certain that they were good to go, they were fully hydrated, and they were consistent because some have a minute contact time, some have two minute contact time, some have 30 minute contact time. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the challenges is that making sure that we're consistent, which is what we're doing here at the college as well. And every dental office and every medical office facility uses these kinds of high germicidal uh, effective uh, wipes in order to protect, again, their offices and the patients. So we go above and beyond what the restaurant and your house would do simply because we really need to take care of things. So we use those kinds of enlisted uh, from the uh, from from the from the federal government uh, as to which ones and when Michael and I went through them all and we found the ones that make the most sense for the college and so everybody is trained on making they were doing it before we just had to reiterate and make sure that everybody followed that protocol appropriately throughout the entire college which is what we're doing now. Wow that is a ton of information I'm guessing we could talk about this a lot longer if we had uh, time permitting we may uh, ask you back at some point, as I suggested earlier, uh, we could uh, perhaps see in a few weeks or a month how well we did based on what we talked about uh, in this uh, event. Right. Fingers Hopefully crossed. they listened. Exactly. <laughs> Fingers crossed indeed. Well, I'm, I'm coming away from this knowing for sure that the mask stays on. 
yes. right? The mask stays on. Outside of the house. Now, what about the, what about the walk in the neighborhood? What about the- As long know, as no one's around you, you're fine. Okay. Okay. Because you remember- the Distance from each other, there's no real reason. And especially if it's a nice, cool, breezy day, which we're not gonna get a lot of now that we're getting into Charleston summer. Uh, so the but we have is, humidity. We have humidity, which causes them to fall out of the air much faster. We can now see our air. Or Michael, you want to <laughs> shoes really quickly? That, that, that's an important thing. People should know that your shoes are probably the most contaminated component of your wardrobe. And so yep. you should maybe consider not bringing your shoes in the house. Leave them in the garage. Leave them someplace where they are not going to be wandering around your house all day long. That's another thing that might be a very wise uh, decision to do. I'm recommending that here at the college that people have work shoes and home shoes. So that this way at work, they leave their work shoes and at home they take their home shoes. And even then I'm leaving my shoes in the garage. It's just the way it's going. Wow. I got picked on at the college by telling them they all had to wear socks. <laughs> um, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the guy who told them they had to wear socks, and so I've been picked on ever since. And they love you for it. <laughs> I know. Not a happy time. Not for college students. Not for no. Students. They're the flip flop generation. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly right. Well, we owe you both a, a great debt of gratitude for joining us, Dr. Mike Schmidt, professor of microbiology and immunology at the Medical University of South Carolina, Dr. John Camisi. Uh, assist, associate Professor at the James B. Edwards College of Dental Medicine at MUSC. Thank you for being with us. Thanks to all of our chamber members with us live and those catching us on the recording. And a big thank you to Mount Pleasant Chamber's own Rebecca Imholtz for keeping us on track today. From all of us at the Mount Pleasant Chamber, thank you for joining us this week for The Pivot. Make it a great week.